Doctor of Chiropractic from Palmer College of Chiropractic, Florida campus. Growing up in Iowa, she attended the University of Iowa and graduated with a bachelor's degree in health sciences and was a member of the Iowa National Guard. While Dr. Callum Behetti is board eligible for the American Board of Functional Neurology and American Board of Neurochemistry and Nutrition, she continues to grow and learn from her patients daily. Welcome. Um, something you believe in. The book of Genesis supports that God put in 
you know, throughout the seven days, things that were more basic, and then ending with things that were quite advanced, which would be us. If you do look at dinosaurs, though, the oldest ones or the ones longest to go were just herbivores. They were on four legs, they ate plants, plants were readily available, they didn't have to have a very big brain to be able to do what they had to do. Um, one of my mentors jokes that you don't need a very big brain to sneak up on a carrot. So, brains were quite small, they didn't have um, much need for advanced neurological development. You get a little more into it, there's omnivores, and um, even before omnivores, plants became more sparse, sparse, so then the dinosaurs stood up on two legs, and then as they stood up, they now needed a better vestibular system to balance themselves and break themselves in the world um, by feeding our two legs. Then after that, you have omnivores, which eat meat and plants. And then the most sophisticated dinosaurs out there were carnivores. So this is the timeline from oldest to most recent. But then the next one is going to show you relative intelligence with the crocodile being right in the middle. Yeah. They're from Florida, so crocodiles and alligators. They're pretty smart, but they're not as smart as some of the dinosaurs were, so you usually can out open for them if you don't get too close to the water. Um, but it does show you that as they developed, as they got on two legs, and as they started to have to worry about either catching prey, so they had to outsmart them, or not being prey, so being to, to outsmart the predators, that we did demand more of our nervous systems and our brains, and we had to develop. So I'm going to tell you that story because it goes towards our pyramid. So this is our uh, plasticity pyramid of neurodevelopment. This is how I assess all the children that come into my office. The very foundational level, so kind of like a pyramid, you need a strong foundation. Just like if you're building a house. You want a good strong foundation so that when you build your walls, your walls are solid and firm. And when you put your roof, you know your roof's not going to crack in two years. So we really focus on the base of the pyramid, and that's <coughs> autonomics. On top of autonomics, you have your neuroreflexes, and then you have your survival reflexes, and then purposeful movement, and coordinated movement, and then the very, very tip, tip, tip of the pyramid is behavior. So behavior includes communication, social interaction. So our philosophy is you need to have that strong foundation in order to go all the way up and have really good behavior. And that's why we, we approach um, our neurorehabilitation a bit differently than other fields. We want to make sure that their autonomics is our set, that their neuroreflexes are present, that their, uh, that their survival reflexes, that used to be called primitive reflexes or infantile reflexes, are gone. Um, and then they can have purposeful movement and then coordinated movement and then really deep behavior. So we're going to focus and break this down a little bit. We'll start on step one. There we are. Nice. Sorry, I'm getting used to the technology. Bear with me a bit. So autonomic function is some of the most primitive function that we have is that fight or flight, rest and digest. So parasympathetic, sympathetic. Um, a lot of the children that we see will be in that fight or flight all the time. So that means that their, their tone's up, um, their pupils can be either constricted or dilated depending on which tone is more present. But it puts you in a state that's, that's stressful. It's not necessarily a bad thing in certain situations. You want to be able to have that fight or flight if you need to get the heck out of Dodge if you're being chased by a bear. But day to day, it's much preferable to be in that rest and digest state. So the autonomic nervous system controls kind of like our, our stress response, um, but it also controls our blood flow. And that really ties into digestion as well. If you're not getting good blood flow into your gut, you're not going to have good digestion, and then you're not taking the fuel you need, and then you can have even a harder time with your rehab because you don't have all the, the fuel to, to help build that brain power and to rehab your body. So I know it's morning, and I kind of want to get everyone up and moving a little bit. So partner up, if you don't mind. Uh, we're going to check each other's capillary refill and pupillary light responses. So capillary refill is how fast your blood refills in your hands. Um, it lets us know autonomic function because your autonomic nervous system controls the tone of your blood vessels. So go ahead and just hold your neighbor's hand. Um, and you can press down, I like to press down the base of the thumb. 
and then count how long it takes for the blood to fill back up or for all the color to go back to normal. And then do it to the other side when you're done. It's good. I know it's cold in here, so peripheral circulation might be a little inhibited. Um, so if it takes a little longer than normal, that's okay too. So calculator go, if you do it on the finger, should be less than two seconds. If you do it on your foot, your hand should be less than four. Um, we've had some, some patients come in and it's taking eight seconds for their blood to fill back up their capillaries. So what that lets us know is if we do something perfectly based, like doing PT and doing body movements, they're not getting the blood to the areas that we need, so they're not getting blood to the nerves and the hands and feet as readily as they need to. So that lets us know that their autonomic function might be a bit compromised. So another good test to do, and we do this on every patient, is a pupillary light response. So a lot of us have phones now that have flashlights, which in a pinch could be a really good um, headlight because it's super bright. So if you're prone to headaches or migraines, no need to do this, but feel free to partner up. You're going to shine the light in your partner's eye and count, hold it there and count how long that pupil stays small or constricted. Relax and see if the other side matches. And if you have a good stimulo-ocular reflex, you should be able to 
look at your partner's nose without moving away. Anyone bring it up to the There we go. But it won't be a full-blown grab. 
you'll go to tickle their palm and they'll find it tickly. That's what some of my, my eight, nine, ten year old children with ASD said, oh, it tickles. Like, yeah, that's a, that's a reflex. We're going to make that go away. So it can be tickly or make your fingers twitch, and we don't want to see that. Um, no one ha did anyone have a grasp here? Okay, good, good. So what we do to help rehab that is we can do a little electrical stim. Some schools of thought say you can do brushing. Um, the thing about the newest type of research is you need to have some nociceptive, which is slightly uncomfortable. Sometimes it's painful, but we don't use any painful therapy where I work. But it's slightly uncomfortable to get those to go away. Another really good one is the moral reflex. So I know where's Katie? Katie works with me at Plus C. She has a persistent moral reflex. So what that looks like an adult is she startles really easily. Um, as children, though, what it looks like is anytime their head drops, they hear a loud noise, or they get a bright light shine in their eyes, their first instinct is to throw their arms back, take a breath in, and scream. So they can make it so that it's really hard to do other therapies if every time you go to pick them up or move their head backwards, it sets off an inhale followed by a very loud exhale. So you can test this on each other. This is how I test it for some of my older patients. Um, my younger ones are ones that aren't as mobile. I'll lay them on the table and I'll hold their head and I'll quickly drop their head just 30 degrees. And then you'll see the arms fly up and it's big breath in. But as adults or older children, what you can have them do is go ahead and stand up. If your partner is much larger than you, go ahead and stand against the wall just so they can fall back. And you're going to clap, and when you clap, I want your partner, whose eyes are closed, to fall back into you, a little trust fall, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. Like this, so it compensates by making you stand like this. 
So if you ever see someone with a pretty big head tilt, there are some head tilts in the crowd today, it could be because your perception of gravity is off. Um, so one of the ways we look for that is we look to see how aligned the eyes are, that OTR that we talked about a while ago, just to see how, how you're perceiving gravity. Because if you're perceiving gravity incorrectly, something that should, you should be receiving all the time as a positive stimulus is now a 24-7 negative or inhibitory stimulus because you're not doing something that should naturally come without you trying. So let's do the figure nose finger testing. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about results once we see it. Go ahead and find your partner again. Put your finger about arm's length away. So, like, all the month, I'll be my own partner. And you're going to, the patient is going to take their finger and touch their own nose and then the doctor's finger. And you're going to go one, two, like, okay, that's right. One, two, three. Close your eyes and keep going. One, two, three. And you should be able to hit the finger even with your eyes closed. <coughs>
of the same little ball of tissues that become your brain also become your eyes. So they're phylogenetically connected, which just means that they're, they're super related. So when we're looking at eyes, I always look at the pupils, autonomic, so right with the fat, eye reflexes with our step two, um, survival reflexes not so much, uh, but now we're going to look at coordinated movement, eye movements. So these will be pursuit eye movements. So go ahead and pair up one more time. I'm going to have you look at your partner's thumb while they trace a giant cross. So left and right, center yourself, up and down. And you should be able to follow your partner's thumb while keeping your head still. And then, doctors, I want you to look at your patient's eyes and see if they get jumpy on you. <laughs> so pursuit eye movements should be inherently smooth. There are tracking mechanisms so that we can look at moving targets in our environment. Anyone have movements that didn't look quite so smooth? Go ahead and pair up. 
This will be the last time. I know I said that last time. This will be the last time. Go ahead, Kara, one more time. The doctor of the group, go ahead and put your fingers, oh, shoulder width apart. Have your patient look at your nose and then tell them, look at a finger that doesn't move. And then move one finger and see if their eyes can jump to the finger that stays still. Do 10 and see how many out of 10 they can perform correctly. The finger that doesn't move. Yeah, so that's why that's a good tricky part. You instinctively want to look at the finger that's moving. That's a kind of a reflex. But you're trying to give it that reflex. Reflexes. 
Um, imagine that as you're doing it, you have a survival reflex that every time something touches your back, your back muscles contract, and that's called a spinal blind. So asking someone to do this when their base of pyramid isn't as, as strong as it needs to be is, is not setting it up to succeed in my opinion. So that's why we really break it down from bottom up. Before I ask you to say the color, not the word, I want to make sure that your vascular tone's looking good that your pupils aren't either super dilated or super constricted so that you can get the proper light that you need in and it's not painful or, or sensitive. I want to make sure that the reflexes that are there to keep your eyes level and still are working well so you can jump from word to word without skipping a line or skipping a word. I want to make sure that any of those reflexes that take away from our development, those survival reflexes, are gone. I want to make sure your movements are purposeful so you can jump from word to word. And I want to make sure that they're smooth and coordinated so that you have accuracy in what you're doing. And then I want you to be able to inhibit things as the last and final step with your behavior and cognition. And that's why we break down the pyramid the way we do. So with the bottom being autonomics, working up to neural reflexes that need to be there, making sure the survivor reflexes are no longer there or are integrated or attenuated, those are all words that mean the same thing, gone is what I prefer. Um, making sure your movements are purposeful first, coordinated second, and that your behavior is appropriate third. So when we're looking at the neurodevelopment of this, steps one through three are all in your brainstem. And that's why they're involuntary. You can't really control them. Your brainstem is the part of your brain that does everything it needs to do without you thinking. It's also a home to cranial nerves 3 through 12, so a lot of the things that you need to heal your face without it being super sensitive, but without it being numb, to make sure your pupils are constricting and dilating as they should. Um, one of your cranial nerves actually starts your brainstem and winds us up all the way down to your gut, your vagus. One of my favorite cranial nerves, it's a really good one. So just to make sure your gut's functioning really well. When we're looking at steps 4 and 5 with movement, we're looking at the cerebellum. And if you're looking at how a, the baby develops in utero, you create your brainstem, and then halfway up your brainstem is your pons, and then it, like little butterfly wings, you get these cerebellum that develop, and they're really beautiful. You have just as many neurons in your cerebellum, even though it's like a third of the size, as you do your entire cerebral cortex. So we have that cerebellum giving us those purposeful and coordinated movements. And then the icing on the cake, step six, your behavior, is frontal lobes. And Five can play in there as well, but six is really the meat and potatoes. Uh, step six is like the, the higher functioning of what we're doing. Uh, that's what I was talking about. My dad's frontal lobes aren't so great. So his ability to inhibit, not so great. Can he do this through? No. No. I can tell him the rules a hundred times, but he's not doing it. Um, he also, you know, they say never, never like treat your family, so he had to give you a different doctor to, to help him with his neuro rehab. But, He's doing really well. So when we're looking at it, we have that brainstem, one through three, cerebellum, four and five, and then frontal lobes and cerebral hemispheres, five and six. So that is our neural development, or our plasticity pyramid of neural development. And like I was talking about previously, when you're looking at building a good foundation, that's what I'm here for. As a, as a functional neurologist or a chiropractic neurologist, I want to make sure steps one through three are solid. But then PTOT, Take it away, steps four or five, PT or OT and speech, step six and then speech, and even ABA is really good for step six as well. They have uh, you know, applied behavioral analysis. So we have a quick video that Dr. Antonucci wanted me to share with you. He apologizes for not being here, but he's here in spirit. Let's see if it plays. Yeah. 
Um, this gives you a quick overview about neuroplasticity and how basically all it is is learning. Um, I really like Dr. George's book, uh, Brain to Be a is the first one. And Brain, yeah, Brain was saying book two is book one. The brain has changed itself. Thank you, Gary. Isn't it good? It just cuts at the end. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. If you have any more questions or would like any more explanations, feel free to come find me. I'll be at our booth. Um, and if you wanted to hear more about the therapies that we do, we'll be talking about that later today. But I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Traumatic 
brain injuries, and even adults too, we see this all the time with even concussions, like mild traumatic brain injuries, this reflex will be broken. Um, the reason this is pretty paramount is if this reflex is broken, every time you take a step, your head moves just a little bit. Um, so there's some situation of your head with any movement. So if you're trying to train someone to walk again, or go through physical therapy to help them with their balance and coordination, and every time they move their head, their eyes lose focus of what they're looking at, they're gonna have a really hard time knowing where they are in space. And if they don't know where they are in space, how are they supposed to maneuver through space? So this is one of the reflexes that we absolutely find care about in our neuro rehab as well. So some of the neuro reflexes are like deep tendon reflexes where you tap the knee and the leg kicks. Um, the ocular tilt that we talked about, and another one that I really like is the optokinetic. Uh, I won't do this in here, but it's when you see something moving past you, or when you spin and things, it looks like the environment's moving, but you're really moving, your eyes catch a target, hold it for a second, and then jump to the next target. But it gives us a sense of where we are in space. So people that have the optokinetic reflex um, broken or not as healthy as they need to, they get motion sick really easily. So they'll be in a car and they'll just feel terrible because every time something moves past them, instead of fixating and then jumping to the next target, they just get really disoriented and they can feel dizzy or nauseous. So we look towards rehabbing that reflex as well. So the neural reflexes are good reflexes. We really want them, they help with proper motor development, proper movement. The next set of reflexes are ones that are great to have when you're a baby, but after about 10 months, you don't want any of these reflexes. So these reflexes, help with that first year of life. They develop purposeful movements, which is the next part of the pyramid, step four, but we're on step three right now. But then it helps with protecting themselves and feeding and bonding. So these reflexes can be the grasp. So we can do this one super easy on each other. If you're an adult and you don't want to hold something, you should be able to not hold it. So if I put my finger in my own palm, I should be able to say, hand, don't move, and it doesn't move. For some children, though, you stroke their palm or you place a finger on their palm and they're going to instinctively grasp. Great when it's a baby, because when the mom goes to touch the baby and the baby wraps his hand around her finger, oh, oxytocin surge. And it just creates that really good bond with the baby right off the bat. But you shouldn't have that as you continue. And the thing with survival reflexes is they used to be called primitive reflexes because babies had them, infants up until about 9, 10 months. But they changed their name because it can occur after a brain injury, like a traumatic brain injury. When that happens, they're called frontal release signs. Same thing, different name, same thing. I don't know why we, we like to name things 18 different ways, just to confuse people. But now we're gonna call them survival reflexes. So it's what you're supposed to have the baby, but grow out of, but they can re-exhibit themselves as traumatic brain injury as part of a way to put that body back into a, I just need to, I just need to live. The issue with survival reflexes is if the whole time you're worried about just staying alive and surviving, you're going to have a really hard time moving past that point to continue forward with your neurodevelopment and neural rehabilitation. So these are the reflexes that we want to see gone. So go ahead and try to grasp on each other. Just place your finger in your friend's palm or stroke your finger across the palm and see if their hand twitches. So 5% of adults actually continue to have this reflex, but it won't be a full-blown grab. You'll go to tickle their palm, and they'll find it tickly. That's what some of like my, my 8, 9, 10-year-old children with ASD said, oh, tickles. Like, yeah, that's a, that's a reflex. We're going to make that go away. So it can be tickly or make your fingers switch, and we don't want to see that. Um, no one ha did anyone have a grasp here? OK, good, good. So what we do to help rehab that is we can do a little electrical stim. Some schools of thought say you can do brushing. Um, the thing about the newest type of research is you need to have some nociceptive, which is slightly uncomfortable. Sometimes it's painful, but we don't use any painful therapy where I work. But it's slightly uncomfortable to get those to go away. Another really good one is the moral reflex. So I know where's Katie? Katie works with me at Plessis C. She has a persistent moral reflex. So what that looks like in adult is she struggles really easily. Um, as children, though, what it looks like is anytime their head drops, they hear a loud noise, or they get a bright light shine in their eyes, their first instinct is to throw their arms back, take a breath in, and scream. 
So they can make it so that it's really hard to do other therapies if every time you go to pick them up or move their head backwards, it sets off an inhale followed by a very loud exhale. So you can test this on each other. This is how I test it for some of my older patients. Um, my younger ones are ones that aren't as mobile. I'll lay them on the table and I'll hold their head and I'll quickly drop their head just 30 degrees. And then you'll see the arms fly up and it's big breath in. But as adults or older children, what you can have them do is go ahead and stand up. If your partner is much larger than you, go ahead and stand against the wall, just so we can all back.
then who missed the target with their eyes closed? Thank you for your answer, I appreciate you. So what we can see is that you should be able to touch your finger no matter where it is. You have that proprioception, uh, which is like your sixth scent, not like the movie, you know, goes, but it's like your ability to know where you are in space, even with your eyes closed, so your body's perception of itself. So if I put my arm here, I should know my arm's there, even if I close my eyes. What we see with these purposeful movements is occasionally you'll have some deficits there that need rehab. The issue with that is if you're trying to have a complex, coordinated movement, but you don't know where your body is in space, you're going to have a really hard time moving, walking, swimming, and doing other more complex movements. So we'll go straight from this into the next slide, which is step six, the top, no, step, step five, step five, almost top of the pyramid, I put down there. Coordinated movement. So coordinated movement is what a lot of people think mm -hmm. of with, well, like OT. So it's not just, can you move your arm? Now it's, can you move your arm and pick up this pointer and put it in your pocket? <laughs> so it's more, you know, occupational or daily life activities, not just the gross motor movements, but the fine motor movements. So when we're looking at this, uh, mirror image movements is a fun one. Um, this is, are you able to mirror someone's hand as they do something as closely as you can without touching it? So it's kind of like what minds do. I'm going to say they have really good coordinated movement. I've never actually had a mind to test them, but they look like they know what they're doing. So you can pair up with your partner again and just see if you guys can both trace a figure eight with your fingertips, getting within the inch of each other with that touching. So one of you is going to have to do like a backwards eight, but I want to see it. Things called square wave jerks or mistakes, 
what you get these abnormal movement of your eyes during your pursuits. And then if you're reading your book and your eyes jump really quickly, you can skip a word, you can skip a line. Um, you can reread the same one you just read. So we look really carefully at eye movements with children with dyslexia. Because sometimes it really is a, a brain base, but sometimes it's just their eyes are jumping on them and they just need to get their eyes and their gaze more stable. And then we've seen people um, actually get a lot better with their dyslexia because of that. All right, now for the top of the pyramid. Behavior. So this is our expression of thoughts in motor form. It involves expression and inhibition. So the very top of the pyramid is your ability to not do something. So we talk about inhibition. Um, I know some psychologists and neuropsychologists talk about children with ADHD. They have a difficult time not doing something. Uh, my father personally has a brain injury, so while I don't have a child with a brain injury, I'm a child of a, of a person with a brain injury, um, and his, his brain injury is mostly frontal, and that's our inhibition area, and my dad doesn't inhibit a thing, you know? <laughs> so if, if I walk in and my shirt's too tight, he'll ask me where my girdle is. But if I walk in and I look good, he'll say, Dad, you look beautiful, Em. I'm like, you know what? I know it's true, so it feels good. Um, but that, that inhibition is a very high function. So when we're trying to work with children who have a hard time not doing something, that the moment they think about doing something, they just do it, we have to make sure that everything else on that pyramid looks really good and their foundation super strong so that when you go on to do their behavior and their um, inhibition and socialization and communication, that you're setting them up to succeed. Okay, so we'll do time. Ant antipsychotics are a good one. This will be quick. So this is another eye movement. So I told you I love eye movements. So if you look at the pyramid, I got eye movements at one, two, three, one, two, four, five, and six. So these eye movements are inhibitory eye movements. If you see a lot of children, if something moves, they're looking at it. Um, kind of like if you remember the movie Up. Like the dog, the dog, the squirrel. He sees the squirrel, he's looking. There's no way he's not looking. That's because the inhibition's not so good. So let's look to see how your inhibition's doing today. Go ahead and pair up. This will be the last time. I know I said that last time. This is the last time. Go ahead and pair up. We're done. The doctor of the group, go ahead and put your fingers, oh, shoulder width apart. Have your patient look at your nose and then tell them, look at the finger that doesn't move. And then move one finger and see if their eyes can jump to the finger that stays still. Do 10 and see how many out of 10 that they can perform correctly. The finger that does it. Yeah, so that's why that's a tricky part. You would see.
So this is something that we work on. Um, we can do different things that we will talk about more about the therapies later today. I'll be talking at, at 1145 on the actual therapies that I do. Um, this is just to give you the, the basis of it. So last test, you do not have to pair it for this one because I told you to be the last of it. It's called a Stroop. Who in here already knows what a Stroop is? Okay, nice. So it's not unfamiliar. And once you see it, you might go, oh, I've seen this before. So before I show you the test, the rules are, say the ink color, not the word.
the baby develops in utero, you create your brainstem, and then halfway up your brainstem is your pons, and then it, like little butterfly wings, you get these cerebellum that develop, and they're really beautiful. You have just as many neurons in your cerebellum, even though it's like a third of the size, as you do your entire cerebral cortex. So we have that cerebellum giving us those purposeful and coordinated movements. And then the icing on the cake, step six, your behavior, is frontal lobes. And five can play in there as well, but well, six is really the meat and potatoes. Uh, step six is like the, the higher functioning of what we're doing. Uh, that's what I was talking about. My dad's frontal lobes aren't so great. So his ability to inhibit, not so great. Can you do this through? No. No. I can tell him the rules a hundred times, but he's not doing it. Um, he also, you know, they say never, never like treat your family, so he had to get to a different doctor to, to help him with his neuro rehab, but he's doing it really well. So when we're looking at it, we have that brain stem, one through three, cerebellum, four and five, and then frontal lobes and cerebral hemispheres, five and six. So that is our neuro development, or our plasticity pyramid of neuro development. And like I was talking about previously, when you're looking at building a good foundation, that's what I'm here for. As a, as a functional neurologist or a chiropractic neurologist, I want to make sure steps one through three are solid. But then PTOT, take it away, steps four or five. PT or OT and speech, step six. And then speech and even ABA is really good for step six as well. They have uh, you know, applied behavioral analysis. So we have a quick video. The Dr. Anthony G wanted me to share with you. He, he apologizes for not being here, but he's here in spirit. Let's see if it plays.